I know is so explosive. Welcome, Climate Viewers. My name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News, and today is December 17th, 2014. And uh, I just did a video on uh, HARP and the SBX, uh, C-based X-band radar, and NEXRAD, and I got a lot of questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a series on HARP called HARP 101, and all the videos will be tagged that way. So please uh, follow along, and we're going to learn a lot about HARP. Now, I put this out over two years ago. I redid it a couple of months ago and I'm going to break it down for you guys in a video. I was hoping that somebody else would cover this, but I guess if you want something done right, <laughs> you got to do it yourself. So here we are. Um, this is my heart page over on Climate Viewer News. If you click harp at the top, it will bring you to climateviewer.com slash harp. And what you're going to see is a little bit about the heart facility and how there are many more like it a research timeline that breaks down the history of space weather modification and plasma seeding and then a ionospheric heater definition they are powerful high frequency transmitters that must be 2.8 to 10 megahertz that induces controlled temporary modification to the electron temperature at desired altitude now we're going to get into all the technical details of that but i wanted you guys to quickly see the heart page and uh our heart map so, heart map, I Google that and you come up to the images and this is what you get. You get a couple pictures that really don't tell you anything. They've got dots and, you know, city locations. These are actually digisons over here. Um, I went and I mapped all this stuff out. I was like, well, this is all kind of confusing. This is actually way closer to the truth. This guy nailed it. Um, but let's really break them down. Uh, this is a digison map. Now, a digison is an ionosign. It's they bounce radio waves off the ionosphere to diagnose it. Um, this is a verification for harp modifications and obviously what the sun is doing to the ionosphere. So, um, the sun is constantly bending and mo uh, molding our ionosphere. It, it it flutters around, and these guys track them. Let's take a look at that real quick. Um, over here, I am on uh, Climate Viewer 3D, and if you scroll down to the bottom, you're going to see Places. Click on that, and then come down to Ionospheric Heaters, Super Darn, and ISCAT. Click on that, and then you'll see all of those um, Digison locations. Now, they're here. Each one of these green marks, they correlate with these spots. Now, this is... a uh, very hard to find <laughs> and I'm a bit of a retard uh, for going through all this but you know I'm, I wanted to be thorough so anyway there's all of the digisons of the world you can go see them scroll into them those are not ionospheric heaters uh, they don't have the re required power to modify it they're more uh, seeing what the modifications are now this other map now this says map of world heart facilities uh, this is the most widely shared version of it and it's it's semi-accurate, um, but it really, again, doesn't tell you anything. This is HARP, HARP China, HARP Russia, HARP ISCAT, HARP UK. Um, none of these are HARP. There's only one HARP. It is called the High Frequency Active Auroral Program, and it is in Kona, Alaska. And HARP is actually, if you want to be technical about it, all of this together is HARP. The thing everybody's talking about is called the Ionospheric Research Instru Instrument, and it's right here. It's 180 towers that broadcast electricity in the sky to alter our ionosphere. It modifies our ionosphere. Now, we're going to get into that right now. So, this is the only harp there is. There is only one harp. It is now closed. They're trying to give it away. And why would they do that? Because there are plenty more around, and they're putting them on boats, and they're building a much, much bigger harp in Norway by 2016. Uh, it's going to be a hundred gigawatts harp at its best. On its best day, was five gigawatts estimated uh, radiative power. Now, 3.6 million watts goes into this bad boy. They pump it from. Uh, they have diesel engines that convert the electricity and they shoot it up into the sky. And uh, the output 
is much higher than what goes in. You got five gigawatts, that's billion watts. 3.6 million watts go in, five billion watts worth comes out. Now over in Norway, the new IceCat 3D is gonna be 100 billion watts. Harp, five billion watts. IceCat 3D, 100 billion watts, gigawatts. Now that can modify the weather for certain. Bernard Eastland, John Hersher, and everybody who talks about it agrees. 100 gigawatts is what you need to alter the jet stream. They're building it in Norway. So let's hop over to Norway. What does that look like? Over in Tromso, Norway, you can see that they have three arrays here. I found this in a PDF. I cut this out in Photoshop and overlaid it in Google Earth so you could see them. Um, but of course, each one of these icons are like little web pages, and I taught myself some HTML just to put all this in here, and you can see every single detail. 144 cross dipole arrays, 5.3 to 8 megahertz, that's in the sweet spot. 2.8 to 10 is what you need to modify the ionosphere in the way we're talking about. So here's the picture, there's some wires, um, lots of photos on that, instrument details from the Cedar, uh, at UCAR, you can come over here and look those up. Those are very interesting. Tons and tons of details. Everything referenced. I know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, and, I, and I'm being that way because I have been down this road. I have sent this to every guy I met that talks about harp, and nobody wants to share it with you. So here we are. Um, anyway, and there's the IceCat 3D details. It's going to be an array that's going to cross most of Sweden or uh, Norway up here, excuse me. Um, and these are receiver arrays down here with the big boy being an upgrade to this. That's coming in pretty soon. Then we have a uh, high pass, which is the high power auroral stimulation observatory. This was a predecessor, predecessor to HARP. Before uh, it was up here, it was in Ohio at the Plattsville um, right here. Plattsville Atmospheric Observatory is their secret little hideaway for testing electromagnetic crazy stuff in the middle of a big fracking well. As you can see here, all of these are fracking landing pads. Nobody in their right mind would ever go out here, so why not put, you know, a HARP radar out here? So that's what they do with this place. Um, high Pass used to be here. They've got some antennas up here. Now, God knows what they're doing, but if you guys are looking for some crazy possible weather modification, keep your eye on Plattsville. Um, anyway, that's super creepy. So, High Pass is up there, and uh, then we have Sura over in Russia. This is their big boy. Um, let's see what the wattage on that is. Now, all of this stuff I'm talking about right now is covered in an article right here. Ionospheric heaters, how they really work. And uh, you can scroll through here. All of the details I just gave you, like this, are um, available in there. 190 uh, megawatt output. So we're talking about millions of watts. I don't know if you guys remember uh, the movie Back to the Future. This is what I like to liken it to. Doc Brown said, 1.21 gigawatts. We need 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts is what he said a lightning bolt was. Harp is 5 gigawatts. And ISCAT 3D is going to be 100 gigawatts. That's a lot of gigawatts. I'm just saying. So, um, <laughs> it, it's pretty nuts stuff. Uh, then we have the new, brand new one coming up at Arecibo. Now, you guys have all seen this in the movies. Let's turn the train on, make it cool. Do, do, do. This bad boy has been in a lot of movies, but did you know that they're building an ionospheric heater down at the bottom? Oh, yes, they are. They had one since back in the 70s, and it was destroyed during in an uh, excuse me, in a hurricane, um, Hurricane George's, back in 98, and now they've built a new one, and it's going to have a 200 megawatt output in the sweet spot, 5.1 to 8 me um, megahertz. And it's only got six antennas, six really, really big antennas, though. Um, yeah, so 25 meters tall. Um, this is going to be interesting. So now, why would they, and this is kind of odd, because you look at it and you go, 
why would they put an ionospheric heater here when all of the ionospheric heaters seem to be up here? They all seem to be up here near the North Pole, pretty much. There's Tromso, it's a little further down. But then you've got these middle band ones. What are they doing? What's that all about? I was really curious to figure this out. And it turns out that really there's only two ways to, mo to modify the ionosphere. And this was very surprising to me. I've been researching this for three years, and I did not find this out till about a couple months ago, maybe three, four months ago. And that's what this article is about, so let's just get to it. Um, there's the Arecibo antennas, just so you guys can see it. And there's a diagram. It's going to have a cast grain antenna um, net, like, hanging over top of it. And here are the antennas. That's a person, by the way, right there. If you see that, that's a person. So very, very big. Um, a scroll past Sura and then Tromso. Nice video on Tromso and Harp. Okay, Elf Generation 101. This is what everybody's talking about. I want this to be very clear and I'm going to explain it in graphic detail. What they're doing is creating a virtual antenna in the sky that radiates extremely low frequency signals that travel worldwide and can be heard in the deepest depths of our oceans. This virtual antenna is called a ionospheric alvin resonator iar now i'm going to give you these scientific terms because if you're interested in googling this or interested in finding out more about it the only way for you to be able to do that is to use the proper terms because google doesn't understand weird terms okay so and there are references with these you can see right there is this one scroll to the bottom Read the references. The references are coming from spp.astro.universityofmaryland.edu, and this is Dennis Papadopoulos. Um, this guy is knee deep in harp. Just Google Dennis Papadopoulos and get started. Um, so let's go back. The ionospheric Alvin resonator is using the ionosphere as an antenna, so it's. It could be considered a geophysical weapon. It's been that's a term that has been used and thrown around quite a bit. So what happens? In addition to creating an IAR, heating the ionosphere with high frequency radio waves will pr produce alpha waves and magnetosonic waves, MS waves. Now what are those? These are geomagnetic pulsations. Okay, now there's a very technical section right here for the science minded, but what you what you really want to pull from this is standing oscillations of the geomagnetic field lines which behave as strings with ends fixed in the ionosphere. So when you move it up here, a standing wave can occur along these magnetic field lines and compressive magnetohydrodynamic waves, magnetosonic waves come straight through. Now magnetosonic are the lowest of low frequencies there are. We're talking zero to like one hertz, maybe up to three hertz. Don't it's in here. So please check that again. Keep me keep me correct. But they're also known as PC1, okay? So periods 0.2 to 5. And and it says in here frequency in megahertz 200 to 5000 um, megahertz. PC1 triggered emissions, and this right here you're going to see spectrum for HARP ULF start experiment, ambient noise. There's the Schumann resonance right there, and then 60 hertz. You can see now HARP has been turned on. Do you see the difference? This was our ionosphere, naturally occurring, nothing happening. Ambient noise, they call it. Now they turn HARP on. Spectrum at HARP ULF start noise increase by 10 to 20 decibels between 0.7 to 10 hertz. And our Schumann resonance, our heartbeat of our planet, has now disappeared. It's gone. And there's now a spike at 60 hertz, which I don't know if you know this, but happens to be the same tone that's in your wall, in your electricity, that drives you batshit crazy and makes you stressed out. Look up ambient EMR and electro smog and come to climateviewer.com and click on uh, right here at the top, click on EMF. But know that electricity affects you negatively. Electricity produces hormones. Hormones produce pissed off people. Um, so messing with the heartbeat of our planet and, and changing 
our background no electrical noise by 10 to 20 decibels, probably not a good thing. Probably not a good thing. But nobody talks about this realistically. So in a paper called Virtual ULF, ELF, VLF, Ionospheric Antenna, uh, Resolving Critical Radiation Belt and Geospace Issues. Now, so you say to yourself, why would they want to be doing this? Well, um, some of it's just experimentation. Let's see what happens. Poke it, see what happens. Let's let's see what comes out. Other parts are, you know, they say they're going to try to protect satellites with this radiation belt remediation. But so why are they at different levels? You know, I was saying, why are they along the, the, the equator? I'm just, I'm seeing them all at the North Pole and these others are at the equator. Well, it turns out there's these L shells. And as you can see here, there's a shell. And if you fire a shot off into space and you're up here at the North Pole, it's going to travel a long distance and come down and land at the South Pole. If you're Sura right here, which is an L shell 2.5, it's going to fire and land at a shorter distance. It's going to land closer to the equator. So it, what we're seeing here is there's a link between how the, tr the radiation transmits transmits and where it lands so again harp up here heated region injected waves go into space they come all the way out here and they land down here at the conjugate point then some of it bounces off and you know aggravates the heads of people all in this region then bounces back into space now once it makes it all the way back to harp that's called a hop now, why am I telling you this? Well, they have a thing out here in the middle of the ocean called the Harp Buoy, and it's part of the One Hop um, experiment. And you can see it right here, Harp Buoy. And it's a VLF buoy. So basically, the place where Harp lands in the ocean, because it has a very specific spot that when they fire it in the sky, that's where it's going to land, they put a uh, receiver out there to listen for it. Okay. And that conjugate point is down here, right off the coast of California. Uh, I said California, Australia. So there you go. Fires all the way around, lands all the way down here. Pretty neat. Okay. Um, and they all have a conjugate point that their transmissions land on. So they want to, you know, move it around. Maybe putting it at the equator would give them a different landing spot is what I originally thought. But it turns out it's much simpler. There are only two ways to heat the ionosphere and do ELF generation and modify it the way they're talking about. And I'm going to go through those right now and we're going to conclude this video. Polar electrojet heating. This is the way all of these at the North Pole work. They heat the, it, I'll just read it, high latitude ionospheric heaters can use the electrojet, a naturally occurring electrical current in the DE region. This is 70 to 90 kilometers, so right about here of the ionosphere as both an amplifier and virtual antenna. Now the electrojet is something special. That's right here. See this ring? Over here on Climate Viewer 3D, i am actually got it up right now to prove my point. So this is your electrojet and let's go over here to heart. This is heart. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. So the reason why they don't need harp anymore because they're not even going to do polar electrojet heating anymore. They found a better way. And the reason they found a better way, the, the reason why these are at the, at the equator now is because of that better way. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So this is the electrojet. And harp, when it shoots its electricity directly into the electrojet, um, can produce... Uh, very low frequency waves um, and right here is a chart from uh, Dennis Papadopoulos you know explaining all this. this is how I just recently found this out he had a great um, series of slides that I read through and um, turns out natural current flow natural currents flow in the auroral and equatorial ionospheric Ionosphere at 80 to 100 kilometers, the high frequency signal heats the, and thereby changes the local conductivity of the ionosphere. The electrojet current is then caused to vary at the same ELF VLF rate. Propagating ELF wave signals are radiating by this radiated by this virtual antenna. So they pump electricity into this. It 
gives off its own radio signal as a result. And that's why we've been hearing these strange apocalyptic sounds all over the world of electrical sounds in the sky, all of which seem to occur in northern latitudes. So please look into earth groans as a topic. And as a cause of earth groans, I would look into polar electrojet heating. Very interesting. So now they've come up with a better way to do it because I see this PEJ heating will produce from point zero zero one hertz to twenty thousand hertz with a two point eight two to eight kilohertz peak efficiency so this can produce elf waves from point zero zero one hertz to twenty thousand hertz and it's best if it's most efficient at two point eight to uh, two to eight kilohertz but they want to go lower and they want it stronger so what do they what can they do that's better this is called ionospheric current drive. Both high latitude and equatorial ionospheric heaters may use an alternate method to produce ULF, ELF waves that does not require the electrojet. Now this means that the present northern latitude, HARP, Tromso, all of those facilities can do both of these and they can do this at the equator. So by heating the F layer, which is 150 to 800 kilometers, even higher of the ionosphere magnetosonic waves are created are creating a secondary alvin wave generator in the e region so basically this chart i showed you earlier they're going to heat it way out here now the waves the ms waves the very low frequency waves they're what cre they're what's creating the antenna now they're not actually just powering the ionosphere, um, the polar electrojet. They're shooting it way out here into space, and these waves are traveling down and creating another antenna. This is very important, and I know this is high level, but there are people who are going to understand this that need to hear it, and they will do something about it, I am sure. These Alvin waves travel upward and follow the Van Allen belt, hopping back and forth, and um, this one can produce what's called shear alvin waves and magnetosonic waves in the chart right here they say 0.1 hertz magnetosonic 2.5 hertz shear alvin wave these are there's a lot of debate on the internet about who's making the 2.8 hertz tone even though we all have seen it on the waterfall chart and we take it for granted this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is hard producing it um so guys over there on tron vlf please get that updated um this is important so there's two ways to modify the ionosphere and the second one produces ULF ELF waves up to 50 to 70 Hertz so from point we know it's at least 0.1 Hertz to 70 Hertz so this is another way they can do it and as a result of them being able to do this they are now moving to boats that's right they're gonna put these on boats and uh, that's that's where it gets pretty crazy so not on the SBX boat not on the SBX little oil thing on a different kind of boat we're gonna cover this in graphic detail in the next video but just a sneak peek trucks and trailers boats submarines planes and drilling rigs project Lucy straw man high frequency array that's right no electrojet a major breakthrough so now they don't need it they can go anywhere and make their elf waves and uh, field-aligned, uh, super small-sized field-aligned scattering mirrors, a.k.a. the artificial ionospheric mirrors. Yes, it's gotten really, really complicated, but ELF mobile array performance, and I know all the details. Coming up in the next video, but that's all we have time for today. I know I've uh, said a lot. Please review the material and keep them honest. When people talk about this stuff, Make sure they know what they're talking about. Make sure you know what you're talking about. And if you find out that I don't know what I'm talking about, prove me wrong. I would love to see your information. So, um, guys, I really appreciate you. Uh, we are currently doing our donation drive for uh, the year. We only do it once a year. Please come over here to climateviewer.com and uh, show us your support. I'd really appreciate it. So without, uh, without uh, people like you giving a F about this, probably nobody would even know, but... 
this is something that affects us all. Uh, elf wave generation can affect your brain, and um, nobody's really talking about it realistically. So, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Love you, mean it.